topic is a comprehensive dictionary of Middle Persian. Now it's on. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone showing up for the uh, what seems like the final presentation of the conference. So I will be talking. Let me use the very last one. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, a project that is very much a work in progress, uh, run out of the University of Bochum and the Freiburg University in Berlin, and we're trying to put together a comprehensive dictionary of Middle Persian. So quickly about the language is definitely a dead language, uh, typically classified as Middle Iranian. So what you have here is like a, a quick overview of the uh, diachronic situation where we have the old Iranian languages, which is uh, Avestan and Old Persian, and we have, we have the naturally modern Persian or Farsi. Middle Persian lies, as one would uh, assume from the name, somewhere in between. And uh, it died out uh, pretty definitely about 1,500 years ago. It is, however, still uh, a very important language for a number of reasons. One, it is the best attested Middle Iranian language. Secondly, it is, or rather was, the lingua franca of the Sassanian Empire, so the first uh, few centuries of the, of the Common Era, just before the Islamic conquest. And as such, it is uh, A, uh, one of the main languages of Zoroastrian religion, and B, it was also used by adherents of other religions, mostly Manichaeans and Christians, but also it exercised much influence on the language and on the culture and on the religion of uh, uh, Jews in uh, what that time was Babylonia. So there's a lot of uh, Middle Persian influence on uh, on the Talmud, for example. The language itself is, was written in a, uh, in a various scripts on various materials. Come on. But in our project, we focus on the largest component of uh, the materials and the script, which is the Zoroastrian Middle Persian, which basically is about 85% of all Middle Persian texts, so somewhere around 700,000 tokens, so not even a million, like a drop in the bucket, compared to other languages uh, that we've seen here. Uh, it is, as I said, a very dead language, so even though it died out sometime around the 8th century common era, the oldest codices, the oldest manuscripts, all those manuscripts that we have are from the 14th century CE, and not all the texts are religious, even though it's mostly a language that was that is attested in uh, in the religious sphere, so we have basically two types of text that we're looking at. One is called Zant, which is actually basically commentary and translation of all the Avestan texts. And then we have non-Zant texts, which are theological, moral, and narrative. So, for example, we have a work that is a, has been described as a sort of a Dante's Inferno of uh, Middle Persian culture. So the current situation with Zoroastrian Middle Persian is that not all texts are very well edited. We have a small portion of texts that are most interesting to people who study the Zoroastrian religion that have been edited many times over, but some of the large texts, especially the interesting ones, the encyclopedic ones, the moral ones, have not been edited. And as you can imagine, uh, this is mostly philological work, so most of those are dead tree editions. There's only two electronic corpora of Middle Persian texts that exist so far. One is Titus, the other one is Parsik. Both exclusively rely on printed edition, so basically just transcribe the printed edition. There is no annotation. And as such, they also ignore any connection to actual manuscript, which is another problem in, uh, in, in Middle Persian studies, in that there is uh, people usually just work with editions and ignore the manuscript tradition, which can be often very, very different from that of the editions. So this is where our project comes in, the Middle Persian Corpus and Dictionary Project. We have received some money from the uh, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Uh, there are three universities uh, involved in this, Bochum, Berlin, and the Köln University. And we aim to do two things. Number one, we aim to create a proper corpus of Zoroastrian Middle Persian that is based on the actual language as it is reflected in the manuscripts. And that is also richly annotated. So mostly what we're doing is uh, creating a tree bank with additional layers of information. And we also want to link the Zan texts or even other non-Zan texts, so non-translation, non-commentaries to Western originals. And our second goal is to create a dictionary, which is most of what I will be talking about here now. Now, when it comes to middle, the various varieties of Middle Persian, there are two varieties, Manichaean and Sassanian Middle Persian, that are relatively well taken care of because, um, as you might remember, they only constitute a small part of the entire corpus. So, 
Uh, if you only have like a few tens of thousands of tokens, it's easy to put together a dictionary. But even the Sasani and Middle Persian ones are kind of in dire need of updating. When it comes to Zoroastrian Middle Persian, the situation is more dire. So we have a bunch of dictionaries that are at this point older than me, which is a lot to say. And some, one of them is even like a, almost 100 years old, which only include 3,000 lemmata, whereas in our corpus we have over 15,000. There's also some dictionaries that were published in India and in Iran. They're not very good. And, and, and then there's a lot of glossaries to individual issues of text, which are you know, few and far in between, which are of varying quality and to varying standards and so on and so forth. This is all something we're trying to correct. Because this is, for example, the best, uh, an example of the best dictionary of Middle Persian, the Mackenzie's one from 1971. This, the last word on the list, is a very, very common one. Apparently it means visible, obvious, and revealed. All right. There's no information on the part of speech. There's no information, there's no examples of, uh, of uh, how these meanings differ in usage. There's nothing except transcription, transliteration, many can example, new version example, and some senses. So obviously this will not do and we need to do better. Well, what do we actually want to do? So we started out looking at some of the good printed dictionaries, like the Oxford English Dictionary or the German Dictionaries or the, uh, or the Dictionary of Real Academia uh, de Español. And then we started thinking, what is it we want in that, in that dictionary? We want lemmas, we want a lot of morphosyntactic information because there are verbal information that, that every user, be they a scholar, be they a student, need to have. We also want to have derivational morphology because uh, Middle Persian is very rich in derivational morphology. And these derivations are not often transparent. We want to have etymology, which is what Mackenzie had. We want to have, of course, meaning hierarchies. We, there's a ton of uh, termini technici in Middle Persian, because uh, which, which relate to religion and to ritual use. And of course, we want to link the entire dictionary with uh, our corpus and other resources. So, and we're thinking on how to do that. We decided right off the bat to employ a formal approach. And this formal approach, uh, consists of two steps. Step number one, we annotate the corpus, as I mentioned previously, trying to create a uh, tree bank. And of course, we use the Kanlu format because our tree bank is going to be based on the universal dependencies format. So we expanded the Kanlu format into what we call the Middle Persian table format, MPTF, and added a bunch of fields. When it comes to the dictionary, to the lexicographic work, we added two important ones, meaning and terminus technicus, which is for those special terms related to religion and ritual use. Uh, in this context, we also added a special field for multi-word expressions, which are also very common in Iranian languages, especially in, uh, in Middle Persia. So you can see here uh, a typical, typical use of uh, a noun and a verb, which would be a sort of a light verb construction. So this is step one on our way from corpus to, uh, to a good dictionary. Step two, uh, so this is an example of how it looks in the, in the annotation. So this will be an entire text in the columnal format. So uh, one column, we, add, we have the lemma, which is used uh, in the uh, universal dependencies as well. And then we note here the meaning and we note here the terminus technicus. This is an int integral part of the, of the annotation. So as philologists and linguists work on the manual annotation, they add all this information. Now, what, we, what do we do with that information? Well, that's our, that's our step two. We formalize what we actually want to have in the entire dictionary. So we formalize what we consider a dictionary entry. There are several ways to do that. We have picked relax and G because of its very simple format. So we could have used TEI, but then that's XML and there's a whole other fields we wouldn't need. This is, this is the short notation of relax and G, which will allow us to very easily define what we want to have in each entry what are optional elements, what are obligatory elements, and so on and so forth. I think this should be quite uh, self-explanatory. So here we have an element that consists of an attribute, then we have a lemma, we have a head word, which we use when we have two different morphological uh, uh, emanations of a single, of a single uh, lemma. Language, morphology, timeline. So this will be corpus data showing us the frequency across, uh, across time. Then we have relative frequencies, types, orthographic variants, which are very important for Persian because there's a difference, there's a distinction between transcription and transliteration. Uh, 
oh, uh, this shifted. They should be up here. And the most important part here is hierarchy census. So this is where we actually store the semantic information. So this is the definition of the entry. This is what the entry, this is what the entry looks like. The right part should be on the hierarchy census. And then again, each of the sub-entries, if it's not uh, sp specifically noted, has its own definition. So in the hierarchy census, this is the main part about the meeting, meaning we can have several elements that are called semantic. We fought a lot over the name of it. Couldn't come up with anything better. And those elements are actually sub-meanings. So let's say you have an entry that has various types of, uh, collects various types of meanings. That will be the hierarchy census. Each of those types of meanings will be a semantic. And it consists of a note, a semantic core, part of speech, morphological forms, and if necessary, an entry on multi-word expressions. And then again, semantic core is the crucial part here. And it is defined as follows. So here, finally, we note the sense. We give an explanation. We add information on the grammar. And uh, if uh, necessary, we enter information on the semantic domain, which is where we try to link our dictionary to, a, to an ontology and add information on uh, the terminus technicus if there is any. And of course, as with every entry, we have occurrences here. So this is basically our model of a dictionary entry. This, these are the information that we want to have in a dictionary entry. And uh, this being a RelaxNG uh, model, we can turn it into anything. So we can turn this, uh, this information into XML, and then we can turn it into an HTML. So for example, this is what an entry based on this would look like. Some of the parts are expanded, some are not. So here we have lemma, part of speech, designation, simplex, or compound. The timeline is not there because the corpus hasn't been finished. Frequency information forms are transliteration, a transcription, sorry, orthographic variants are trans, uh, transliterations. Then if you click here, you'd have attestations. And this is the hierarchy census part that consists of uh, individual semantics, which then if you would uh, expand them, you would see more of the information. Okay, so this is how we model a dictionary. Now, as for the Now, as for the technical implementation, we are using a database. And in this database, we have to transfer this model into something that a database would understand. Because you know, we could use XML, but we don't want to, uh, because that's not the proper solution. So when we model the same lexical data, not as dictionary, but the data that underlie the dictionary, we rely on two basic uh, fields, which are lemma and meaning. Lemma, once again, is derived from a token. So the entire corpus is basically a list of tokens, which has information assigned to it, as, as you've seen previously. Uh, from those, a lemma is derived, which inherits this information, as the case might be, as you know, transcription, transliteration, part of speech, uh, all the morphological information as like a union of those information. And then each lemma is also connected to a, to a basic field meaning. And that's basically it. These three things, which in a sense are just two things, that's, that's the fundamental part of the database of how we store the lexical information. That, that allows us to be very flexible, to add fields, properties at will, and to link individual lemmas with meaning, and then link meaning with lemmas all the other way around. Search based on meaning, search based on lemmas. Uh, this will also allow us to actually add other categories. So number one, M, multi word expressions are very difficult. We essentially add them as combinations of lemmas in a, uh, and link them as graphs, not as trees. So we can, we can have a single uh, multi word expression leading to multiple, uh, multiple lemmas and vice versa, a lemma leading to multiple uh, multi word expressions. Uh, this is much easier with taxonomy. Taxonomy is basically just a simple tree uh, structure which is then linked to both lemma and the meaning, but fundamentally the meaning on the basic level. So the technical implementation is uh, also quite simple. We're using technologies that have been so far proven to be uh, mature. So nothing quite fancy, just simple Django with GraphQL for, uh, for searching. Uh, one addition is that we use lexical marker framework for the handling of, of multi-word expressions. Uh, 
And on the front end, we have a React.js app, and of course, there are APIs that lead from, from the back end through, through the front end to uh, whatever you want to use. Well, they kind of work 50% because it's all work in progress. Uh, so in, the, in, in Django database, the lemma is represented in the, in the most simple way. It has the word, it has the language, it has the categories, which can be expanded at will. It is connected to a multi word expression in a, in a very simple way. Yes, it is a part of a multi word expression. No, it is not. And then it is also connected to related lemmas and meanings. And that is it. All of these fields are flexible. All of these fields can be added to at will. The same goes for meaning, except there is even, more sim uh, even simpler. There's the meaning, which is a text field. There's related lemmas, there's related meanings, and that's it. So we're trying to keep this model as simple as possible so that, for one, we don't have to worry about the entire uh, data structure, but also if you know, um, somebody should uh, be run over by a bus or if uh, the project financing goes through and the project needs to be uh, transferred somewhere else, everybody can just familiarize themselves almost immediately with how this works and start working on it further. Now, this is the current status of the project. Like I say, it's a work in progress. We've only been at this for about two years. So we don't actually have a model for entry as such. We only have things that on the fly connect lemmas and meanings. That's also because the lexicographic work has not uh, begun yet, but we're ready to add it if it turns out, if it turns out to be necessary. And as uh, in terms of future work, we will be developing the, this tool into a full-fledged lexicographic tool that will be adaptable to essentially any language with just a minor, uh, a few minor changes in a single configuration file. We will also add Elasticsearch-based uh, semantic search. Uh, and uh, for now, we kind of plan to use an English-based taxonomy for that sort of search. But uh, within the next few months, we'll also start working on word embedding models for Middle Persian and developing a special ontology for Middle Persian, especially for the religious language. So that is basically, thank you very much. If you, want to, if you want to look at what the entries look like, there's the second link. The first link will bring you to the entire project uh, database uh, with the texts and uh, everything else. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. And do we have any, any question, questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah. Hi, one thing that I was really interested in is you're talking about problems, and you didn't have time to dwell on it, mm -hmm. but you're talking about problems with the printed editions versus the manuscripts, and that's always a problem, but I'm wondering specifically for Middle Persian, what are some major things that the printed editions really obscure? Uh, that's a good question. Number one, uh, there's different standards in uh, transcription and transliteration. Uh, it kind of has to do with the nature of the Middle Persian Pahlavi script, so uh, that's uh, when we go into, into too much detail. But uh, different standards in transcription, transcription uh, and transliteration are, not, uh, are the first thing. The other thing is the authors very often implement, sorry, the editors very often implement their own understanding of the text and its structure, where you have two different editions differing in how people even divide the text into sentences, let alone like larger sections. So this, this can be a big problem when you're trying to put together a, uh, a tree bank, which is, of course, based on sentences. So this, these are the two biggest issues that we're dealing with. Number three is that there are some editions of text that are based on manuscripts that are late and deficient. And in the meantime, new manuscripts have come to light which reflect a better version or more complete version. So this is a standard philological problem, not that relevant for uh, for computational lexicography, but still uh, annoying. Mm, any more questions? Uh, so, if uh, I may ask, uh, yes. uh, you said uh, this was a cooperation of uh, three universities yes. from Germany. Yes. Um, uh, is there uh, is a one of these uh, 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 representing uh, users of, of, of the uh, dictionary of Middle Persian, or are you in touch with 
the uh, actual users. Uh, I presume it's uh, two of them are actually represent the users. So uh, the Freie Universität Berlin and the Ruhr Universität Bochum, they actually both have departments of Middle Iranian Studies, where uh, the philologists and the linguists who work on the annotation will also be the users. And the the Köln Universität, they basically provide the digital humanities infrastructure. So um, two of the universities actually are uh, kind of uh, the, the the target group, or actually a part of the target uh, target user group. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, no more questions. So thanks again to Slavomir from Ruhr Universität Bochum. Thank you very much.